Department of Environmental Health and Engineering, and I'm proud to be a member of the Council of Honor of Sustainable Energy Institute. And in the panel here, we have the director of the uh, Institute, uh, Chair Professor of Civil Engineering, Civil and Systems Engineering, uh, Ben Schaefer. Um, uh, we both graduated from Cornell, I'm proud to say. Uh, Yuri Dvorkin, uh, who's a new faculty member here, who graduated from my second favorite university, which is the University of Washington. Um, and he's uh, a new faculty member in civil systems engineering and electrical computer engineering. Recording in progress. <laughs> and um, an assistant professor. Um, who graduated from Penn State and just uh, finished, wrapped up a postdoc there. We're going to talk about different aspects of energy, energy uh, renewable energy. There's chemical aspects, there's physical aspects, there's systems and, and mathematical aspects. So I'm going to first tell you just a little bit about my journey to renewables. I've been working in this field for next year, it'll be 50 years. Um, so 50 years ago, it was all nuclear energy was going to be the wave of the future. Electricity use was doubling every 10 years. And then we had the Arab oil embargo. Um, and eventually, President Carter uh, said that, gee, we just need to build a lot more nukes, a lot more coal plants. That was what we thought was going to happen. Then, of course, Three Mile Island occurred. Uh, Chernobyl occurred. Uh, we became aware of acid rain as a big problem from coal. So maybe that wasn't such a great solution. And so instead of going in that direction, the uh, whole energy system went in another direction. There was a committee in the National Academy of Sciences called the Committee on Nuclear and Alternative Energy Systems that met back then and said, well, what is the future going to look like? What's so fun about it? energy as a field is that no matter what you think the future is going to be, it's going to be completely different. There are going to be such surprises. So they said, okay, obviously there's going to be a lot of nukes, obviously. Um, and then they looked at the renewable landscape. And there was this, there's this one pathetic sort of wooden uh, wind turbine on top of a mountain in Vermont. And they sort of looked at it, and you could tell that they were kind of laughing. And they said, well, that's clearly not the future. Yeah, they're cute in the Netherlands, but windmills aren't going to be practical. It's going to be geothermal that's going to be the big source of renewable energy in the future. Uh, and you may all be aware that's not quite exactly what happened. So since then, we've had more surprises. Um, nuclear has flattened out. Electricity demand is doubling every 10 years, also flattened out over the last uh, 20 or 30 years, and natural gas has largely displaced coal, which has really helped our lakes. We've solved, largely solved our acid rain problem. Um, we've gotten rid of lead and gasoline. We've solved a lot of environmental problems, but I've become aware of the climate problem. So I heard a uh, prominent physicists in the 1970s say that they thought that we were headed towards another ice age. Our perspective has changed quite a bit. We are, that's important. Fortunately or unfortunately, not where we're, we're going. Um, since then, we've had more surprises. So wind has actually become very practical, and so, so has solar. The projections we had in 2000 and 2010 for how much of those renewables we need to build are pathetically low. We've built five times as much uh, wind and solar since 2010 as the International Energy Agency projected. And that's because their costs have fallen so much. So that's been a good surprise as opposed to Chernobyl or the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which have been bad surprises. We're going to have more surprises in the future. And you're going to hear from our panel about well, what they think maybe some of those surprises might be uh, the technologies they work on. Um, we, you, you should all consider careers in renewable energy. It is, the electric system is just so important uh, because it's, well, first worldwide a source of a quarter of our greenhouse gases. It's part of the problem. And it could be the major source of the solution. The other 75%, a goodly share of that, 
transportation, buildings, and industrial uh, sources of carbon dioxide could be eliminated by using clean electricity. Uh, and, and these folks are helping us figure out um, how to do that. So uh, just to finish my little introduction to myself, this is what I do. This is the this is a retired coal plant in the UK. It wasn't retired at the time I took a train by it. And um, this is what's this is what's replacing it. Um, the UK started the Industrial Revolution with coal and is ending it. Now, the Stone Age did not end because we ran out of stone. The oil age and the coal age are not run, uh, ending because we're running out of these things. It's because we have been doing it. Thinking about these better ways, for Professor DeWart that we'll talk about, we use mathematic methods called optimization and we use economics. So if you have a chance to take an optimization course, do so if you want to work in this field. This is the coin of the round. This is how we run all our systems. And economics is incredibly important. Um, so I'm interested in decarbonizing power systems. I want to operate the systems in a smart way, and I want to build the right sort of stuff that's called resource planning. And finally, I'm in the business of also policy design. I'm the main advisor for the California power market. When California leads the way and uh, leads the world in so many good and bad ways, one of the good ways is it's very aggressive renewable energy and carbon policies. So um, I'm going to give each of the panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about that, their research, and we'll talk about some surprises and take, take your questions. But as you, you're going to see that maybe I obviously have a lot of enthusiasm and love for the field of renewable energy. They're, they're even more over the top. So um, now let's see, why don't we go ahead with Yuri, so I'll find and put up your slides. Thanks, Yuri. Uh, hello, everyone. My, uh, my name is Yuri, and I just recently joined Hopkins and Rosie. It's a great pleasure to be here and to uh, hear on Hopkins and, uh, on this particular symposium. So, what I'm going to be talking about, sorry, a little quick. So, what the point I would like to make is that engineers can contribute greatly to, to our society in general, and we enjoy the result of their work. Today, what I want to see is how a specific type of engineers, uh, energy engineers or energy economists, it's very hard to put the line between the two because we use the same skill, uh, the same set of mathematical knowledge to solve our problems. How this particular type of engineers could, uh, could help uh, us to get to whatever vision of a sustainable society we have. And the big surprise of the past year, something that uh, is a positive surprise, is a good surprise, is that now we finally know what the future is. We have very concrete pledges all around the world, and in America in particular, and uh, we need to engineer the support system, the infrastructure that's going to support us in that transition. And uh, before the change of the last year when IRA was passed, the massive piece of legislation, which is going to cost uh, a lot, uh, we need to understand one important thing, that a lot of IRA provisions are discretionary, so there is a lot of flexibility in how we're going to move between point A and point B, where we want to be in 10, 15, and 20 years, in 25, uh, 27 years. But one of the key understanding here is that this discretion needs to be used wisely so that we avoid bad surprises down the road. So as Ben pointed out in his introduction, uh, energy sector can be viewed as both an enabler of decarbonization of other sectors and as a significant chunk of reduction for potential emissions that we can be output from replacing fossil fire generators. In order for us to use clean electricity to power transportation sector, industry sector, building and residential sector, which collectively account for about three fourths of the emissions, uh, we need to have a way to operate the power system, which is going to be very different from what it is today. And if we look at the power system, the way it's being operated today, despite years of innovation and modernization, uh, there are still a claim to, there is still a claim to be made that the power grid is being operated at its limits. So if we add demand for electricity, if we're going to be more apt to various events within the grid, it means that we're going to push it further to the limits. So that is a problem. 
because even at this point, our system is an infrastructure. It's vast. It spans all parts of our life, all parts of our country. Geography of that system is unprecedented. In terms of the rate of changes that happen in this system, it happens very quickly on sub second time scales, and it's very hard to change. But within this huge, very quickly changing infrastructure, when we say the word limit, we only talk about limits we are aware of. And we don't know many of those limits. For example, we don't have full observability over that system. We cannot say what happens in that part of the infrastructure at that point of time yet. Another thing is that as we introduce more variable generators, such as renewables, the system starts to inherit certain properties of this um, resources that is stochasticity. So the state of the system and its ability to be within limits or outside of technical limits, uh, it increases. The system moves from one state to another far faster than it was before, and we have less controllability because in case of this form of a controllable fossil fire coal generator, we can change its output and we can do it definitively. With wind power, we don't have control over wind. With solar energy, we don't have control over solar. So taking together these issues put us in already vulnerable position. But when you think about the large footprint that an energy system, a power system has in the country, you think about its increasing role, there is, there'll be an unavoidable question that this will become even more vulnerable during stress conditions. Because even right now, in many cases, it takes a long time to recover the increased supply following a large natural disaster. And I'm not talking about like one in a thousand year storms, which now happen every other year or so. I'm talking about like uh, the strong winds, which we had three days ago. This weekend, with a very strong wind here in Baltimore. Did you see any fallen trees? Which, yeah, one of those was on my street and it sort of cut the line, but they recovered in two hours. So it could have been much worse. Um, so from this viewpoint, one of the key issues that we want to address is to fundamentally rethink the problem with underlying power system operations. And traditionally, and you can see this scale in the top left corner, which I lifted from my PhD advisor's book. Uh, <laughs> traditionally, it was a balancing between engineering and economics, where engineering aspects were responsible for understanding what are the technical foundations of system operations and how we can use this technology to operate system reliably. Basically, the notion of availability was reduced to understanding that the system should be able to withstand a given number of contingencies, and it should not interrupt power supply for longer than X amount of hours per year, where X is a fairly small number. Economics were responsible for saying that while you can build a very reliable system, uh, it will cost you a lot of money. So you have to find a way to ensure that a given reliability level that satisfies our society is attained at an affordable cost. Now, as Ben pointed out in his example, it's uh, not very practical. We want to integrate other concerns into it. We want to think about the environment. We want to think about climate. We want to think about economic development. And this balancing, which has been very hard on its own, is going to become a three-way balancing, which is going to be even harder. And we need to find a way to balance our societal priority with our engineering capabilities and to make sure that they don't going to cost us an arm and a leg. And if we think about the biggest surprises where think we need to be very careful about, that would be this four items. I mean, you can see that both good and bad surprises can come out of it. One of the most important things that entertains and fascinates me is that we are very well aware about the end goals. I'm pretty sure that by now, everyone in this room heard about net zero. Everyone heard about 2035 goals, or for example, in some other countries in Australia, 2050. In some other countries, it could be 2030. So we have a sense of what we want to achieve at the end and by what time, but we really have no idea how to move from the current point to this future goal. The other thing is that we always have to keep in mind that the grid on its own, the energy system on its own, is going to become increasingly complex. 20 years ago, we had gigawatt scale energy storage, farm hydro energy storage. We had this technology 40 years ago. But it was a technology which was operated in a very straightforward way, charge, 
when you have access, discharge when you have that set of power in the system. Right now, this dynamic is very complicated because we have more products, we have more markets, we have more distributed, not concentrated technology. We have certain constraints on this technology explained by its physics. For example, battery degradation and capacity decay. We don't want to use up that capacity all the work to make sure that we can operate better sustainable over a long period of time. So if we want to operate the system of the future, battery storage will be an important part of it. And we need to take this into account. And that's only going to complicate our decision-making process. Um, imagine that we answer some of the first two questions about complex grid and larger grid. And we think about like, you know, a feasible trajectories. We will never be able to boil this down to one particular answer. We will always have uncertainty. This uncertainty will be multiplied when you take into account various factors of offer. For example, operational aspects, long-term planning aspects. And there will always be factors which you will not be able to account for. For example, the work in Ukraine was one of those which introduced a tremendous shock. And in some very unanticipated way, it helped the decarbonization because right now, the consumption of gas in Europe is reduced drastically. It's going to cost a lot, but it's one of those trade offs that we've been anticipating came as a surprise. And there is a lot of problems. And just to be sure, I would say the most important problem is to incorporate various kind of externalities because we always talk about the energy system in a broader economic and social context, but it's very difficult to incorporate those items explicitly when we make those decisions. For example, it's important to incorporate input some carbon into some air pollution, it's important to integrate models that account for that. And it's a very hard task to do, especially in a country which is as diverse and as complex as America, where we essentially have 50 states making a lot of decisions that may affect how the country as a whole will achieve the end goal of this time plan. And these are the kind of questions that we're trying to answer in my life, and I think I'm way over my time, so I better come now. So I'm Roger Rossi. I'm a brand new professor. This came out of the box because I started like <laughs> and, um, and uh, I'll bring a he, he looks good in shirt. I'll bring a slightly different perspective of the energy sector because I, I focus on the sustainability of the water and energy infrastructure. So these two uh, element uh, element together. So there's no question that water is the most important resource of our planet. We use more of it than any other material. And uh, every single one of us need to drink something around one gallon of water every day. Now in the world, there's a lot of people that actually do not have access to one gallon of water every day. And uh, um, at the, there's a 2 billion of people that actually do have access to one gallon of water every single day, but they cannot drink it because it's not safe to do that. And it's not safe because the water has not been treated properly. Um, you look at this map here and you see that there is a very, very small fraction of uh, countries that actually treat more than 80% of the water that they use. And so they don't treat it, they take it out from the environment and then they return it back and it's contaminated with either organic, inorganic on compounds or even pathogens. And this basically contaminates the whole water body and they cannot use it anymore. So, well, the answer could be simple, right? Just say, well, we need to enforce the water treatment, but uh, it's not that easy. Uh, and the reason is because water treatment consumes an extremely large amount of energy. Think about all the energy that we need for the supply of water, distribution, or wastewater treatment, the transfer, desalination, and so forth. And the issue is that those countries that do not have access to clean water or that do not properly manage and sanitize their water, they also do not have access to energy like electricity and so forth. And so I'll I'll take advantage of this symposium to promote a little bit my work and my lab. 
uh, I worked on a bioelectrochemical system and I scaled it up from something larger than sort of this to something larger as this um, podium here, for example, um, to basically treat the wastewater, sanitize it, and uh, return it clean to the environment and at the same time generate um, energy. You can think about these devices as very similar to us. So what we do is that we eat the food, we oxidize it, and we transfer the electrons to the oxygen when we breathe. Well, these systems um, take advantage of bacteria that cannot use oxygen as final electron acceptor. So what they do is that these bacteria start to grow onto these carbon electrodes. They release the electrons to this electrode, and then I artificially close the circuit to this uh, white panel, which are the cathodes. Now the transport of electrons generate electricity. And so in one system, we can do two things. One, we can generate electricity while we treat the wastewater. And two, we reduce contaminant and, we, and um, we clean up the wastewater before returning it to the environment. So I have very limited time and um, this is how the system works. You see that we go from wastewater here to our system and then end up with clean water. This is even drinkable. I can drink it. I, I don't it. But basically, you know, there's a limited concentration of organic matter, pathogens, and, uh, and so forth. And the energy generated will be used for powering heat, heat, uh, heating units or pumps, for example. Uh, now, you can imagine the installation of something this simple into a very small town or remote rural village to um, properly manage the, the water treatment. Now we've seen that uh, there are technologies that can manage, properly manage and sanitize the, the water. And we've seen that there's a lot of energy consumption in the water infrastructure. How about the energy consumption of the, um, how about the water consumption of the energy infrastructure? This is a Sankey diagram released by the DOE. The blue is the water consumption, the green is the energy production. You see that there's a lot of connection between the two where they continually exchange one another. <laughs> and actually, the energy infrastructure last year consumed something around 130 teragallon of water. That's a lot of water. But try to make it, if we try to make it um, more um, understandable from an individual point of view, you operate the 60 watt incandescent light bulb for 12 hours a day for one year. It's going to consume around uh, 6,000 gallon of water, just this length. So, um, every change in the energy infrastructure uh, of the future with the advent of 5G technologies and renewable energies should always keep into account also the impact that this change, this transition can have on uh, other sectors, like, for example, the water sector. I need to close now. And um, this is basically what I worked on to uh, water infrastructure, energy infrastructure, and the intersection between the two. So the next step in my lab will also be including the climate change and how it is going to impact the uh, water infrastructure, for example, changing the water availability, and uh, also the energy infrastructure, changing just what you just said, how is it going to change the uh, energy production and how that change is going to affect the water infrastructure. Now, this is the end. And um, I wanted to say that I'm, again, I'm a new faculty here. If you are students and you want to work in the lab, please stop by or send me an email. I have a lab that is uh, ready, up and running. And if you are faculty, shoot me an email and I'll be all, always happy to talk. Thanks, Gerald. Before introducing uh, Ben, we, there is there is a question I want to ask the panel, but I also want to see. Uh, I'll first find out after uh, Ben speaks um, whether you have any uh, immediate questions for any of the panelists while we uh, while they're still fresh in your mind. Uh, I can take them. So hi everyone, uh, I'm Ben Schaefer, professor here at Civil and Systems Engineering, and I'm the director of the Ralph O'Connor Sustainable Energy Institute. That's a mouthful, so we just say Rosie, even though it's Rosé, you know, in terms of the abbreviations don't quite work, but it's all good. So I suppose we came together uh, because your university is trying to demonstrate to you that it cares about sustainability. I mean, it's like why we're here, why we're having a symposium, right? 
Um, and I can tell you that two years ago, um, uh, the university more than just brought us together, it made a real commitment to sustainable energy. One part of what we're trying to do in uh, sustainability at, at Hopkins. Um, so uh, Rosie, um, if you think about it, this Earth Day will be two years old. Um, and if any of you have had the pleasure of spending time with a two-year-old at all recently, you have some sense of where we're at, right? So we can do some things, can babble and sort of make sense some of the time, but mostly you'll find us digging around in the trash causing problems, right? So um, that's kind of where we're at in our development curve, right? So we're growing, but what, but what resources have we been given? We've been given a real investment um, as a way to catalyze all of you that are already here at Hopkins to let you know there's a place where there are a group of people getting together, uh, working on sustainable energy and getting funded in sustainable energy and making connections to both funding agencies through local communities that are interested in sustainable energy topics. I mean, we're you know, sort of working through the, the whole thing and, and we want you to be um, uh, a part of that. Um, but it also means we're two years old. So often the answer is, 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 is part of the way there. Um, as Rosie has tried to figure out um, what it can do in the sustainable energy space, um, I'll describe it once in kind of a research context, so you know where we had existing expertise at the university and thus have invested and tried to double down on that. And then I'll try to describe it a second way in terms of more broadly the areas that Rosie's trying to contribute to where you might be able to, to help, not in a technical way, but in, in, a, um, in a sort of more community level way here at Hopkins. So in terms of research, there are any number of a huge uh, number of topics that we could do. Um, but ultimately, uh, at least initially, we're working in primarily four um, large areas of sustainable energy. Um, carbon management and carbon capture and writ large, and we've, we've seeded and both had success externally bringing in uh, work in that area. And that's largely um, chemical engineers, chemists, material scientists, mechanical engineers, all sort of working in that um, space. Um, the second technical space that we've been working in is storage and storage combined with solar. Um, uh, one of the um, uh, large parts of Hopkins that most of us don't spend much time getting to know unless there's a really specific reason is the Applied Physics Laboratory. Um, and they have a huge number of folks there that uh, work adjacent to energy and a lot of work in storage, like batteries that you can shoot a bullet through. It's the Applied Physics Lab, right? Um, but what does that mean? That means that a battery in your car in the future that doesn't blow up when you get hit. That means batteries in your bike that you store in your apartment doesn't create a fire in New York City. I mean, so battery safety, as we're now about to have batteries, you know, we have little batteries now in our pockets and sometimes they're extra warm or sometimes somebody tells you about what to do with your laptop battery. But now imagine we all have huge batteries like this. So, so technology that'll get us to next generation batteries is a really huge, we need it for the grid. So Yuri can be happy. We need it for our, our phones. We need it off grid. We have it. So we've got a lot of work going on in storage. Um, uh, we also had some uh, really nice expertise in wind energy, uh, and so particularly on the fluids and the infrastructure side for wind energy, so there's a group working in that. I'm a structural engineer, which means I love big things in terms of my personal research. I work on wind turbine power. Uh, and then um, working on the transformation of the electrical grid um, from kind of the market's policy systems standpoint, as well as kind of the power systems engineers, new inverters, new control to dynamics, et cetera. Um, so we have that sort of space. Um, and that sounds like a lot, and it's too much already uh, for us, but it's a drop in the bucket compared to like the larger space of sustainable energy. So you may be very interested in something that didn't fit exactly in what I've talked about. And we have people at Hopkins, there's about 60 faculty that are um, affiliated in some form with Rosie, about 20 that are really working with us on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and that larger group might work in separation or solar energy or any of a, a number of topics that get outside the technical domain. Um, for us, the cross-cutting domains, which are not developing technology, because Rosie's mission is to develop technology and get it into the world. So whatever it takes, whether that's policy to get it into the world, um, or whether that is actually a company to get it into the world, that's what we're trying to do. Research is affecting climate change by bringing new technology. Um, but the cross-cutting areas, uh, community, education, policy, and translation, really open up a lot more different opportunities for you as a, a hockey person. So the community part is us all coming together and working on these problems. Um, that's a high school program that we created that's brand new that'll start with its first pilot group um, this year. That's a new energy minor that if you're a bachelor student, you can join. That's support for the clubs and students that work on, for instance, our collegiate wind team, which has made it to the national finals the last two years in a row. Um, uh, that is uh, working with the graduate students and bringing them together in sustainable energy across departments that don't normally talk to one another. 
Um, and that is developing and going after resources so we can have more graduate students, postdocs, and research scientists that can work in sustainable energy, right? Um, so all, all across that effort, we have uh, our first summit was in January, and we will have on the Wednesday before classes kick again. So at the end of every January on the Wednesday, we gather together like this, but focused on sustainable energy. So if you didn't see us last time, kind of sound will be um, next year. Um, in terms of uh, the two big um, areas that we're, we're really um, a toddler trying to find our way is policy and translation. Um, so uh, like the rest of the university, um, we're all focused on our new real estate down uh, in DC at uh, 555 Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, and uh, trying to figure out exactly what we can do in terms of providing more resources for technology to policy efforts inside sustainable energy. The hunger for groups that are convening to try to figure out what we're doing in sustainable energy is enormous. Um, and so if you have interest in that space in any way, please uh, talk with me um, and I can help you connect up with both the friends that we're creating in political science, um, economics, um, anthropology, et cetera, that are kind of helping us work on these topics but also at SICE and then at the DOE and all these other groups that are actually doing it. Meeting. So we're very interested in uh, being uh, a group that is helping that kind of convening happen so we can all figure out the problem together. And then Rosie is really invested in, in the technology side of making it happen as well. And then the last part is translation. Um, translation for me is definitely two parts. I've spent a life in sort of public policy translation, so I don't like it when translation only means companies. Uh, so I, I, I wanna recognize that part. Um, but we believe that there is a, a huge void in the ecosystem here uh, at Hopkins to help particularly students, um, both undergraduates, graduates, postdocs, et cetera, uh, become leaders in uh, sustainable energy technology. Um, and for many cases, that doesn't mean going working for EASF or one of the really large companies. It means taking an idea that came from their work at Hopkins and getting it out in the world as quickly as possible and getting it scaled as quickly as possible. And so we're working hard now um, to connect with and bring in the resources so that students can do that. There's already a nascent thing. So like if you're a student that's interested, I can tell you, you do this thing at i and meet with GHT and everything, but it's not energy specific. The person next to you is gonna be working on biology. The person next to you is gonna be working on technology. The person in front of you is gonna be working on biology. The person behind you is gonna be working on biology. We're awesome at that at Hopkins. Um, so how do we take a new topic that we're all interested in, uh, sustainability and a specific part of it, sustainable energy, and make Hopkins as impactful on that? That's what really we're trying to do. Thank you. Yeah. Before taking some questions and then going to the panel, let's say, if, in, if, you, you, if you are focused now and in, in, in looking at employment, there's a speaker from uh, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory coming tomorrow at noon in my department, and he's happy to meet with students to talk about careers in the federal government where he came from before, uh, doing energy systems, renewable energy systems, and in, in, in national labs. There are just so many opportunities, and so many of our students are going there, and they need many more people, including perhaps some of you. Uh, but uh, so I'm going to be asking them, you know, 10. If you go back 10 years and then look at what's happened since uh, 2013, what incredible surprises have you seen in perhaps in your field? And then looking forward, um, you know, 10 years from now, of course, you won't be surprised because you, you, know, you know the future well, but unfortunately, like Cassandra, you're going to be, uh, your fate is to never be believed until after it happens. I will ask that question to the panel, but first I want to see if there's some follow-up questions in any, in any of the, the talks here. I saw that hand first and then this hand. Okay. Actually, I have two questions. First question is the zero energy use for converting wastewater to freshwater. Other than possibly the issue with the weight of it, is that something that is being considered or looked at for space programs? Or we're, or we're sending off uh, people, you know, even the International Space Station, which is being, well, is not got much left to lose, but in going to Mars, is that a system that is adaptable to that type of an environment? That's my, my first question. Second question is going more on policy. We hear a lot about wind turbines, but there is a considerable amount of vocal people push back. Considering that you know, <laughs> birds get killed, 
whales get killed? What is the environmental impact? And what can we as a sustainability focus area say, hey, this is the real situation. Yet we've already done research on this. This is how we're so mitigating those issues. Okay, Ruggiero, going to space. You're in the astronaut training program, right? They get that shrink wrap back on. <laughs> So um, there was a lot of there was uh, a lot of people in applied business was the space station and the space shuttle and uh, uh, where was the head base in Iran um, sponsoring that um, there are two main issues one is the space so they take, for this device they take some space <laughs> to be developed and um, uh, the other issue is that it's a um, it's, a, it's still a biological process, and uh, most of the time it's hard to exactly determine what is going to come out of the system at the end. So we don't really have a clear answer out of it. We know that we can use the produced water for, for example, irrigation, but as I said, I wouldn't drink it. <laughs> and I wouldn't ask anybody else to drink it. But after that, you know, that being said, there are other treatment technologies, like, for example, reverse osmosis that can be applied to the uh, exiting the waste water and then uh, recycle it and then use it for, for painting. Yeah, I was thinking because of the fact that it's zero, the, with the zero energy factor, is that that has an advantage because you got to get the energy from somewhere and you got to yeah. get the energy yeah. from the device there. Yeah. Would it work? With you? Yeah. I see your, your point. There's still some work to do. Uh, so I can address the, the wind side, um, and it's a great, great question, and probably on a lot of people's minds. Uh, I have a couple of different ways of, of, of talking about it. One, let's just talk it from a, a, a rational, technical perspective, right? Realizing that will not win the day, right? But let, let's just, so uh, from that perspective, um, the, the DOE and other organizations have commissions, many of which are complete now, um, which demonstrate um, both empirically and uh, for biological studies uh, about the bird kill and it being much, much less than anyone's, you know, overstating it. Very simple things that we can do to determine blades that even increases it further. Um, uh, studies with, with that there's no demonstration that they can understand, right? I mean, what you don't understand, you can't comment on, right? You know, about um, actually uh, that the construction of the monopiles um, causes problems for whales um, or that uh, if you just think about a, a single steel pole existing in the volume of the ocean, that that is like a, like a fish killing uh, event. Um, for sure, the fisheries that would get shut down kill way more fish uh, than you know what we have. Um, but we have to recognize that um, these are not technical arguments that we're having. Um, so you need to have the, the, the technical argument behind you. Um, you need to make uh, decisions about when you make energy, all energy has a cost. Um, and so uh, if you're replacing uh, a dirty fuel, which already pollutes the environment, and there's there's, there's cost to that. I mean, that, those two things have to be weighed against one another. Um, but more importantly, you have to understand that there are specific industries that win and specific industries that lose. And if you follow the money, um, you will see that most of the articles that are coming out right now against wind farms are not local, a local person that's really frustrated about it. It's a national organization that's come in and funded these arguments for them to be made. So we are having the normal national debate we have in the dirty ways we normally have it. Meanwhile, in some of the red states in the country, they have more wind energy than anybody else. So these are not... Um, this is policy, right? These are not debates that are really about technical topics. These are emotional topics about jobs that people have had or are losing and might have or might you know have in the future. Um, and uh, that's why we also um, are trying to partner with some of our friends in anthropology and sociology and things like that, because in many ways they have the answers to whether or not this really happens. Because if a society we choose not to do it, we know damn well we can stick our head in the sand and go do 50 years of something soon, because we've done it you know, in the past. So yeah, it's it's a it's a tough one. Um, also, what was it about six or nine months ago? We were all really frustrated with EVs. They're the dirtiest possible thing. No one knows how to recycle them. They're all made in China. But this week, we're really frustrated about whales. Like our news cycle demands that you have something to be frustrated about. That's what drives it. And so right now, we're doing whales off Jersey, and now we're going to do I don't know what next six months later, and you know that's going to continue. 
What am I going to do about that? No, I'm just going to keep focused on solving the problem. Okay. Uh, thanks, Ben. We had another question here. And, and welcome to the folks online. I see Ching Yu Zhu from uh, Beijing, and I see uh, Sarah McGarity from uh, Columbia. These are all graduates of, our, graduates of ours. Thank you for joining us, all of you. So um, that was the next question, and then this one. All right. Um, so I work at APL on the Applied Physics Lab, and we are currently trying to get our hands around what electric looks like on our campus. And having worked in, I worked in the utilities. Um, we just, I did some calculations on the BTU offset into, you know, KW. And uh, I just don't know how, how technically, I don't know how, are we being uh, intellectually honest with ourselves when we when we think that we're going to get to net zero by 2035. Um, uh, Yuri, has the, Yuri has the best line on, on this. So whatever we, I heard you take the classes, but I don't want to take it, but if you would, if you would, uh, it would be great to take it. <laughs> okay, so the issue is very simple. Um, we now talk to the entire all the economic sectors. So we need to start a conversation who's going to break the bar grid first. Okay. Who's going to break the grid first? Because that's how it actually gets solved. Oh, so we have to break. Uh, we do. We absolutely do. Because I mean, we're American. We're not solving it. So we have to. We're not going to make it. When we're driving that car off the cliff and then halfway down, we're going. Oh, it's going to take a lot of time to solve this. So we need to break as fast as we can. And another way to look at this problem is something that years ago was a bizarre idea. And yet, to try to drive very dry fires. It was the way to think about electricity as a commodity. Every time when somebody's going to try to break the grid, it's just going to be a push to improve the grid. The way how things are going to be used in 2035, where it's now being used right now, is completely different. <clears throat> we, there are serious proposals written by credible people saying that the role of the transmission grid is going to be completely revised. And that's the main problem, man, right? Because a lot of electricity is going to be pretty small for it. It's going to, a lot of electricity is going to be pretty small for it. Well, you know, I mean, we could have that debate. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure about the street, yeah, but, but uh, you know, it's bigger point. I mean, I, I JM is, you know, has delivered the United States, our economy <laughs> depended on cheap energy, right? So, 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 so you're going to break that, understand you're going to break our economy, right? No, but you're along, you've got you have to start. So, as soon as so as soon as we thought Texas was being we thought Texas being electricity change. As soon as we thought Texas being electricity change, we thought Texas being change, right? Uh, and Texas economy. Yeah, and Texas had to own, to do with it. Texas own electrical grid is the perfect demonstration of like what can happen quickly if we're going to change the grid. I mean, it, it operates. Oh, yeah, exactly. Us exactly. So, 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 so they didn't have the spin resources because <clears throat> they idled them no. too early. Well, there's a okay. So I understand that you're you're an expert in this topic. And I'm not an expert. No, no, it's not an expert. So I, I, the broader point that that, that I that I would want to communicate um, is that all of this are like, you're correct, and there is like and for APL it's a particular problem because what the military needs to do and what, what we need to do are totally different failure rates that we can accept. Right, right. I mean, so they're they're very disjoint problems. <laughs> but what does the APL campus need to do is very much what this campus needs to do, right? We need to be a we need to be a leader. We need to push out on it. We need to figure out for ourselves how hard it's going to be, and if that means that we're at the leading edge of quote unquote breaking the grid and, and not breaking it that it stops forever, but that we actually are sort of really pushing on it and becoming part of the incentive to get the grid to improve. Yeah, absolutely. I think we got to take that position. Have you had um uh what's his name Kazi? We've had the uh, chairman of uh, BGE um, out a couple of times. And he is very much um, bullish on on electrification, um, but he just thinks that it needs to be done in an incremental way versus um, trying to just legislate um, a, a time. For instance, he say we should set goals and we should have goals over time versus 2035. 
everything's gone. You know, I mean, it's not really, well, we have a time limit. It's, it's, it's aspirational. Could I take a couple more questions? Because we're all, we're supposed to end at 10 up. What's it? We're supposed to end at 10 up. Is that right? Okay. So we have, we have a couple minutes left. So I want to get a couple more people. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's been so interesting for all of us, I'm sure. Uh, I was just wondering, I'm in a position interested in policy, and I was wondering if certain renewable energies lend themselves better to certain sectors, like when you're looking at decarbonizing buildings, do you think of a specific energy type versus transportation? How would you go about that? Great question. Uh, yeah, super sector dependent. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, but every every sector is probably got a different slice of energy and decarbonization that's going to work for them. So, I mean, even if, as a physician, even what the uh, hospital is looking at in terms of trying to lower their footprint looks very different than an office building right next door, even though you might think of them as very similar buildings, right? Uh, so uh, the downtime that you can accept um, is very different, which changes your energy profile. Uh, I mean, so, so they're all super sector dependent. You pick one, and I think any people in the room as well as us could help, you know, sort of like, okay, this is where people think we're going in that particular sector, but it is definitely going to be a lot of different answers. Is there like a particular resource that helps outline this, or is this just like all of your knowledge? Me, mean a reference? Yeah. Like so the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, uh, has a new report every handful of years, and they've just come out with their technology report within the last year. It's dense. It's not light reading, but it's all there with a, a lot of references. It's all in one place. So just Google that, and it's free. Um, yeah. the internet, uh, IEA, Internet Energy Association. You go on the web and you can dig into the steel making sector, and they'll have the yeah. pages on you know their ideas for that. And, and and most of those are you know various versions of folks are trying to implement. Yeah. yeah, you're you're turning on a fire hose if you go to these websites, though. It, yeah, it's a lot. I mean, like like, like pick a pick a narrow topic, and you have a chance of success. Yeah. Uh, one last question, then we'll go to lunch. Yes. Thanks for um, all of your work and presenting. Um, I guess I'm trying, I'm kind of coming from an outsider's perspective, like um, I'm staff on campus and um, I'm more trying to understand um, sort of how do experts in these fields really keep the lives of humanity and, you know, the eco ecological well being like at the forefront um, because. You know, we can see this very intricate uh, and deeply connected relationship between having a, a high use of energy um, and when, as soon as um, that declines, like in global recessions, you also see how, you know, that's detrimental to people's well-being, even though that's exactly what we have to do in a very rapid amount of time. Even 2030 is kind of a joke in terms of like avoiding extinction in like the long term. And relatively short term, you know. Um, and so I just um I'm wondering if you can speak to sort of the um where where is the technology really at in terms of saving our planet? And I, I that's like a big question. Um, but I think that it's quite appropriate given the fact that you know Earth Day is coming up. We had however many million people take to the streets in 1973 and or 1970 or whatever um and i think that's kind of the the what we have to sort of resurrect or for all of us to be really focused on like what's the goal for our lives and for the lives of humanity um and kind of work backwards from there rather than what the energy sector has done for decades which is saying fossil fuels come first even though we knew 100 years ago that they were having a detrimental effect on the climate and um you know and everything else comes second so i i don't know if you can speak to that larger question but i do appreciate your thoughts on kind of where we're at our I, I would just give a really short answer even though i am I'm a research professor engineer and i'm 100 invested in new technology and all the wonderful solutions that it will provide we have the technology in hand right now just not the will to scale and move away from fossil fuels. It's it's existing PVs, it's existing solar, it's existing geothermal, it's existing hydro, some things that we may or may not love, it's existing small nuclear, it's the whole energy, it exists. Scaling it and doing it is a societal question that we have seen to have now decided we went from no to maybe. 
right? In 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 the last couple of years, right? We put the money behind me. Um, word on the streets that pushes us to yes and make the commitments real and actually scale all the existing technologies. We can we can absolutely get there. So it's it's not a, it's not a technological question. Doing it so that um, it doesn't have major economic impacts. Um, learning from it along the way, um, finding new solutions to make it even better, and and getting all these the synergies from this investment in a new direction where we can create whole new types of jobs, whole new types of fields, or whatever. That's real, and that can happen. But even if we decided not to do that, we could actually solve the the, the fossil fuel problem. That we've made that choice, right? Um, so if that's why it's worth still being on the streets and pushing administration and pushing the social policy uh, aspect of it, in addition to the science technology. And we, we mustn't forget about all those uh, white and light blue places on Ruggiero's map throughout the world that aren't not yet are not yet experiencing that revolution. And that that's going to be one of the big challenges is uh, it may not be 2035, it may be 2040. Those are aspirational for us. But what's it going to be for uh, the Horn of Africa? Um, so we do have to conclude. There is food next door. So I'd like to thank the panel, Cheryl. Thank you. Thank you, audience, for coming. Enjoy the rest of your day.